and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, <clears throat> and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Creator of the upcoming RPG, The End of Kings, and the and a man, and a man who uh, who understands the value of percentile, the one and only Simon Todd. How you doing today, man? I'm doing very well, thank you very much. Thank it's you. lovely to be here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for coming on. So, I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, as is tradition around here. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Back in 1979, I was on holiday in Rhode Island and I decided to go and get some postage stamps and I went to a store and before you got to the bit where you got the postage stamps, there were two boxes on a shelf. One of them said Tunnels and Trolls, the other one said Dungeons and Dragons. I asked the lady, she said something like, I think there are Thurian and have come from England. So I just... <laughs> like randomly chose Dungeons and Dragons, got back home, opened the box. You had a sheet of card with numbers one to a hundred, which were the percentile dice. And I couldn't make head nor tail of it. It took me two days to figure out that a level in a dungeon wasn't the same as a level of a character. And what was a hit point? What was hit dice? And finally I figured it out, got back home, sat my mate down, my friend, friend down and we went through the b1 dungeon and i haven't looked back mm -hmm. uh so that's 1979 um yeah so and very soon i was winging my own dungeon so i must have spent from about 1981 onwards basically making it all up as i went along um and then finally about 10 years ago my wife was saying why don't you write some of this down so this is what's ended up with me here today really mm -hmm. So, given given that, what I do find interesting is with with the end of Kings, you are you're leaning into a D a D one hundred system. Um, yes. Now, there are mo there are multiple points of entry when it comes to when it comes to percentile dice. Some mm. people get into it through Warhammer Fantasy. Some people get into it through basic role playing, i.e., Rune, i.e., RuneQuest, um, yes. Call, um, Call of Cthulhu, and mm. Pendragon. Um, those are the those are the two big pillars when it comes to D one hundred. Was it th was it through one of those two that you got that it you was. got intro introduced? Which one of them? It was it was Call of Cthulhu. I um, be way before I found role playing games, my big obsession was horror movies. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the old ones. We're talking about the universal ones from the 1930s. And also, I loved reading uh, ghost stories, more than horror stories, like M.R. Jones's collection of short stories, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, and Lovecraft, obviously. And then when I found out that Call of Cthulhu existed, I just picked it up. And the thing that I fell in love with most was the skill system. Mm -hmm. The fact that players could literally have a go at anything. That, 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 that you and, and the problem for me at the time with stuff like Dungeons and Dragons is you were limited to like third level fighter. Oh, you've got seven proficiencies. Mm. And I thought, well, well, really, really? And then you go to Call of Cthulhu and you can go, you can have a go at anything. And I thought, well, if I'm going to create, if I'm going to take the opportunity to actually do my own role playing game, I'm going to magpie, I'm going to steal the bits which work best for me from all the systems and the percentile ones seem to make the most sense. Uh, I love the idea that at the end of each game you actually roll a dice to find out if you've learnt new things and that's what I've carried into the end of Kings. Mm -hmm. And When it's interesting that you mentioned that you mentioned that st that particular style of hor that particular style of horror, since well, I have I I have I've always had a fascination with how with how a lot of a lot of those early horror stories ended up get ended up getting made, and 
Mm. And just and just some of the craziness that ha- that happens when trying to get films made. Period. Especially yes. suit actors don't get suit actors don't get no, don't get enough credit at times because it can be absolute hell being in those things. Yes. Uh, the the big example I always I always bring up to people is oddly enough RoboCop because yes. That suit, which was which was a whole a whole lot of plastic and fiberglass, was about eighty five pounds. Blimey! Which, to make it even worse, they were filmed. Even though the even though that film is set in Detroit, because this was the eighties and it and it was going through a futuristic kick, they were filming in Dallas. Okay. So you got a heavy ass suit while you're in the hot Texas sun. Yeah, and yeah. you're and you're being trained in mime. Yes. Oh. And and you know the you know the other horror star that fits that perfectly, and that's Boris Karloff in the first Frankenstein. Yeah, uh, he used to he used to have to get to the studio at something like three thirty in the morning mm-hmm. to get the makeup applied. Yep. He couldn't take it off until the other end of the day. He had asphalt spreaders boots on. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would have must have been hell. I mean, there's are, are pictures of him in the canteen trying to drink with a straw, you know. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. When of course, some um, the the other the other story I I often bring up is the whole thing with the Terminator skeleton, where somebody fucked up in communication, and what was supposed to be made out of fiberglass. End up mm. being made out of cast iron. Wow! <laughs> and to make wow. it wor- to make it worse, they were guerrilla filming, i.e., no permits. Okay, I didn't know that. So, <laughs> so you you're 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 night you're night shooting without a permit, and you've got a prop that's so heavy it takes three people. Mm. That's crazy. That's They'd, crazy. Mm-hmm. They did get busted once, and the excuse they used was that they were film students who didn't know any better. I love that. <laughs> somehow, somehow it worked. Mm. But now, given now with that with that in mind, would you with the end of Kings, yeah. given the era that given the era that it takes place in the 17th century, um. Yeah. There's always there's always a bit there's always a bit of a a bit of an obstacle when when you're focusing when you're focusing on a certain piece piece of history because there's the assumption that in order to play something like that you have to you have to have a significant amount of foreknowledge. Have you have you taken steps to present it in a way? In I a way I, that's I really. I realized that straight away. I knew that, and I've basically gone out of my way right at the beginning of the book saying you don't have to know anything. If you want to place the era of seeming Dungeons and Dragons on in the real world with the burgeoning possibility of steampunk thrown in, then go for it. And you don't have to. It's literally, in terms of the peasant populations of the time, identical to a D&D village. Mm-hmm. And you've got instead of magic users, warlocks that tend to have come from the universities and courts. Mm-hmm. You've got cunning folk who are like the hedge wizards. You've got priests. So you can basically, as you treat it like a D and D game with matchlock muskets, that's fine. Mm-hmm. You don't have to know about the real world. I've put, I've put where I can real information from research that I found, but I'm constantly stressing the point is to have fun. The mm-hmm. point is to change history, if you want. You know, kill the king earlier, save his life, whatever. Um, it's, And I think to, to be have that fear, you, the fear is you don't have to break history. It, it's, 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 it's not going to get damaged mm-hmm. if suddenly you bring in hot air balloons over the English Civil War and start having um, grenade grenados being thrown from them. Have a go at it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it should be a big sandbox of fun, really. Yeah. Now, just just out of curiosity, what what made you go with the D one hundred system for how for how you handled things? It seemed to have an 
obviously could do a d20 you could and that's dividing into five percent mm-hmm. uh but i i just i've always enjoyed the percentage i th- i I think part of the fun of any role-playing game is the physical rolling of the dice a lot. And Mm -hmm. I think the percentage system has got enough of a nuance and the fact that you can sort of add 6% here and 8% here, and it's it's all in hundreds, you know, it it, it just works. Um, I didn't want to make it complicated. I didn't want to reinvent the system itself. I didn't want to suddenly have a whole new set of terminology. I mean, uh, if, I, if I look at quite a lot of role-playing games and I start reading through the mechanics of them, and then I have to look elsewhere to find out what words they're using and why they're using those words and and why have they got those systems. And very soon I said, okay, you've made it really complicated. It's like designing a new car and just completely reconfiguring how the engine talks to the wheels. It's, uh, I don't see a point to it. Mm-hmm. If you've got these systems that I can say, okay, it's a percentage system. You roll a percentage. If you get equal or lower to, than that, you've done something. Mm-hmm. And it's as simple as that. And it covers everything from fighting to performing a skill. Um, and you don't have to know more than that. It just does it. Mm-hmm. Now, with... I. I will note that one one advantage that you one advantage that you have with this setup instead of instead of using a d20 is not having to deal with with spell charges, but instead using points. Yes. I'll be honest. I've never been a fan, I've never been a fan of the whole spell of the whole spells per day thing that it and the ch- mm-hmm. and the um, charges. Yes. I'll leave. Oh. Uh, the Vancean model, as it, as I've often called it, after Jack Vance. Yeah. Yeah. The irony is that the irony being that the Dying Earth RPG by Pelgrane didn't even use it. No, that, that's yeah. Ah, uh, and the main reason I'm not a fan of it is ju- is just in a lot of in a lot of um, settings that use it, it's the use isn't exactly justified in the in the setting. Like, mm. Mm. Well, consider consider the dying consider the dying Earth books. Though that is a very sword and sorcery where magic is poorly understood and is treated like this hyper math. Yes. Can you really that do... a... go ahead? That there is a, there is a potential danger with the end of kings, and I'm I'm not I'm criticizing it in a good way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want players to say, I mean, they start off low low level cunning folk. Mm-hmm. I've, these are, that's the actual, that's the term that modern scholars are using for the people that they were calling witches. Mm-hmm. Um, the the, the low-level conning folk at the end of Kings will have something like a twenty percent chance of being able to cast a spell, which seems like awful. But then I've thrown into it all sorts of things. They can carry with them like elf stones or etheric jars, which hold magic in them as well. And they will also add a bonus to be able to do it. If they've got their mentor with them, then half the mentor's skill chance is added to it as well. So there's a lot of, there's a little bit of calculating going on. So that 20% can get up to 65%, depending on the circumstances. But what I, why I've tried to do that is to allow the players to say, right, I'm going to cast this spell. I'm going to get that material component i'm going to harvest it under the full moon i'm going to get some pure water from that spring i'm going to make sure that the time is right and the cat's out of the room um what percentage chance do i have dm mm-hmm. and 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 so it becomes a little bit more if they want it to and that's another point if they want it to they can get really interactive with the nature of spell casting so mm-hmm. so Everybody's carrying around with them the magic points, Every, even if you're not a magic user. You can actually siphon magic points off other people as well, mm-hmm. if you're being like that. But also, there's these things called etheric jars that actually like batteries. And, and so, for instance, a, a priest's holy cross can carry up to 20 magic points. Mm-hmm. So when they're, when they're casting their prayers... Uh, they will be drawing them from the cross first, and they can be replenished by putting them on the altar and praying to God, and they'll get you know, restored and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I want players to be as imaginative as they can 
with how they play their characters. If they don't want to do that, then it's very simple to just strip down all the rules into roll that percentage, you've done that, move on, do that. And and, and I wanted the game to have that flexibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it comes to the actual where the spells come from, Again, I've been looking at the actual research. Cunning folk would be getting all their potions and their charms from their mentors, and that was real. They'd be getting them from their grandmothers or from the other little old lady down the road and stuff like that. Um, People that consider themselves to be alchemists in the period would be going to university, and they'd be studying theology, but they'd be studying the arcane arts as well. Mm-hmm. And, and all I've done is I've thrown a little bit of the, I suppose, Hogwarts element in and say universities have actually, some of the universities have got um, Warlock as one of their uh, study choices if you have the right money to mm-hmm. go into that in the first place. Yep. So, so I've tried to integrate it in. Um, um, the other point, is because of the period in reality, both King James the First, who was sixteen oh three to the sixteen twenties, he actually wrote a book called Demonology, and in that he was basically highlighting the best way to go witch hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then his son Charles the First did likewise. They were really into all this stuff, and I thought, well, in a world if magic was a real thing and rather than a, the paranoia that it actually was, if it was actually a real thing, then the court would de- need a different system. So they'd have a licensing system. So what you have is the witch hunters would be going around looking for the unlicensed casters around the country. Mm-hmm. So so there's that element to it as well. So, But all of this... It's up to, ultimately to the game master how hard or cold they go with all these different systems. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the idea that um, if you're a licensed spellcaster, then you probably get greater advantage in marketplaces and stuff, or you can go to court and they'll go, you're licensed, okay, you're allowed in. There's, there's all those elements as well. So mm-hmm. I've tried to create a game where the players feel as if they can just immerse themselves in the logic of it. Mm-hmm. And I do find it interesting that that you've in, that you've introduced a class system into what's what is what is essentially a game that's using the basic the framework of mm. basic role playing and and similar matters. Yeah. Since yeah. a lot of the, a lot of those games have a more universalist um, approach, and I have actually done that in the way to do say okay we've got the origins of a character mm-hmm. they were the pub's cook so they'll probably have quite a few skill points in cookery and probably in ma- marketing and bartering but then they became a clubman so they were kill hauled into becoming part of a local militia for a while so they got mm-hmm. a bit of training decided to become a soldier so they turned into a militia man whilst they were doing that they went over to europe for maybe five years to be part of the 30-year war mm-hmm. where they got god so they have come back and they've become a cook who's a battle-hardened priest mm-hmm. so i'm quite happy for them for characters to start off being one thing a priest can become a witch hunter so, 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 if you will, the actual class system is extremely loose. It's more of a sort of a, I suppose, a, a, a positive stereotyping. I'd, so, I'd say it falls. I'd say it falls squarely within the realm of archetype. Yes, yes, yes. Good word use, definitely. Uh, especially, especially yeah. since the aside, aside from some of the gifts that are, that are given to each, there, I do know. Th- that you have a you have a skill list and prime attribute list for yes. a lot for a lot of the classes. Yes. And that 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 indicate that indicates that these are the leanings of set of said class. Mm. But the, but don't think but don't think that you're limited to just that. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, you can go completely against the grain. You can actually have a character with incredibly high intelligence that just wants to be a soldier. Mm-hmm. You know, and, 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 and it's all about... I mean, 
the la last few times where I've had people rolling Dungeons and Dragons characters, I've sort of said, what do you want to be? Let's form it around your image of the character and then we'll literally place the attribute numbers the strength intelligence and wisdom we'll we'll just we won't use the dice we'll just put them mm -hmm. we'll work them out if how clever are you oh i, I don't want to be that clever okay we'll call it we'll call it an eight then so i've been that sort of elastic quality so that the players end up playing someone they really want to play uh on the odd occasion of course someone goes just i'm going to play what the dice tell me you know, and some players prefer that. They want a challenge. Um, but yes, so ap uh, an archetype is a really good word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that, and truth be told, I I prefer I prefer ar I prefer um, a archetype design, mm. just because because of the fact that in a lot a lot of times when people do cla do full do full on class design. There's the poss there's the possibility of them doing it a bit too rigid. Yeah, that's not to say I'm not saying that classes them classes by themselves are too rigid or too defining, but there's the potential for them to be. Absolutely, it, absolutely. Once again, once again, it all once like many things, it always comes down to um, execution. Mm. And. One of the one of the other thing one of the other things I, f I find that's cer that's certainly that's certainly interesting is some of is some of the uh, some of the class entries that you that you have um, li that you have listed the one that one that um, particularly struck my attention was if you forgive my mispronunciation uh, woodkern mm -hmm. yes woodkern's good mm -hmm. yeah that's an actual they they were real. Um, um, what I've basically, if you imagine Robin Hood, mm -hmm. really, um, and uh, where I'd place them in the game is certain, and, and you can play this game anyway, they belong almost in the same area as the pagan priests mm -hmm. that I've got there, which I suppose are druids. Uh, the wood kerners uh, have basically stayed on the edge of civilization the whole time. If I, I in, in the system I've got, I've placed Ireland as the western side of Ireland and some of the northwestern parts of Ireland, like Donegal, mm -hmm. uh, Christianity has attempted to get to them and failed miserably. And they're still in open communication with the other side of the Vale, where the Earl folk, the fairy folk, are still quite alive and active. So those sorts of barriers that the line between the christian territories and the non-christian territories you're going to get the wood kern and they're basically freedom fighters they're the ones that will stop these missionaries trying to get in uh and they have they know what matchlock muskets are but they'll never use them because they've been trained all their lives with bow and arrow and they're far superior uh i had a chat with a reenactor Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, you've got 30 archers and you've got 30 musketeers. And he went, okay, the musketeers will run. And I went, why? He says, well, the problem with the bow and arrow was that in reality, you'd have to learn from a child how to use the bow and develop your muscle structure. So he said it would probably take about 10 to 15 years to develop the right techniques to use a bow and arrow. A musket can be taught in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And but you can get about ten to twelve shots off with a bow <laughs> compared to the maximum of about three in a minute with a musket. So literally you'd be up against machine gun fire if you had an army of bowmen. So that's where this is why I like the the uh woodkern chance. They've they've seen muskets, they don't see the point in them. Mm-hmm. So the classic Robin Hood types still have a few spells because they're going to be in touch with nature. They're going to be um, keeping to themselves. They probably won't be living in towns. Um, at, but it's if you're being that as a player character, you make of that what you will. Mm -hmm. You know, a sort of almost like a Tarzan type character, maybe. I don't know. It's up to the players. Yeah. Now... With that, with that in mind, with that in mind, 
when it when it comes to when it comes to um think when it comes to things like combat. Yes. Um. A lot of a lot of given the given the fact that you that this can go as low or high as as you wish. Um. Have you have you t have you taken steps to make sure that there's a degree that there's still a degree of lethality when it comes to um co when it comes to combat, e whether it's between other humans or humans and non-humans? I've, I've I've this is where the playtesting comes in to find mm -hmm. out how it actually works. If you're if you're uh, what I mean, the system is this that basically you roll the percentage to see if you've hit, you do the damage, and then you take off the opposition armor points from that damage mm -hmm. so if somebody's wearing what these the sort of clothing they'd be wearing they'd have a helmet either a lobster tail or a morian helmet they've got roughly the same scores on them you've got gauntlets you've got what's called a buff coat which is a heavy leather tunic and then some of them will be having a a, a front and back plate which is called a cuirass and you add all the armor points together and they could be have eight points so unless you've caused more than eight points of damage they're not going to get touched um i've had a chat with people about this and they said well that's actually quite accurate in some respects loads of people died but most of them were called clubmen they didn't have any armor or they just had padded armor these sort of like quilted coats um i'm not too worried about that element in it but mm -hmm. there is okay if you score within 5% of your target total for hitting somebody with a weapon, you will always do maximum damage and their armor does not, uh, is ignored. So basically you've got between the chink in the armor and you've caused maximum damage. Mm -hmm. So there's always the chance. There's also an incredible amount of damage that can be caused with spell effects as well, depending on circumstances. So, they also have got, on average, between 10 and 15 hit points totals, health points. And it's not many. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look after your character. But um, I, I think it's vital that every game has to have a chance of death. It's got to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I'm not overly concerned if people don't die a lot in the game you know it's not i'd rather people enjoy playing their characters and immersively going through it certainly with the non-player characters if they get down to about two or three hit points they will drop their weapons they mm -hmm. will they will kneel down and go uh, god god of mercy please spare my life that they're, they're not it's not like dungeons and dragons where they're down to one hit point and saying come at me i'm still alive it's not going to be like that and it's up to the players whether they role play that as well. If they get down to two or three hit points, would they would they give in? Would they drop their weapon and say, "Will we look up?" You know, and and it's a measure of role play really whether mm -hmm. they do that. You know, yeah. So that's how I've treated it. And of course, since since you brought up the whole thing of eight of a dozen muskets versus a and a dozen bow and arrows, yeah. Um, one per one particular issue that that can crop up when you're dealing with games with it with different tech levels is hmm. make is making sure that cer that certain t that certain types of weapons are st still have a viable spot. Yes. Uh, just as an, just as an example, I remember playing Shadowrun Returns, and the amount of disadvantage w when it when it comes to having a melee build in that one is going to make everybody use firearms even though that is yeah. not exactly within the fantasy of a game like Shadowrun. Mm. So so that's the that's something that I've that's always always in always in consideration. And obviously there's a whole it's a whole different can of worms when you're dealing with 17th century versus yeah versus the versus a dystopian future. Yes. Yes, it's a dystopian past, <laughs> sort of. Uh, I mean, if you the more the more I digged into the actual history of the place, it really was a dystopian past. Mm -hmm. They thought the world was coming to a, an end. 
They really thought when Elizabeth Tudor died that the world was coming to an end. And then this king comes to the throne that was that was the only option they had, but they had to break the law to allow him to come to the throne. Mm -hmm. And the... And, and it's a strange, it's a lovely description of End of Kings. It really was a dystopian age. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you saw it in the religions, all the religions splitting up into bits. You, you had the Anabaptists, the Baptists, the Quakers, the, you know, the Muggletonians was a fab religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they all decided to go off by themselves and start arguing with each other. And a, and a lot of the English Civil War was founded off uh, an initial civil war between the Scots and the English. It was a sort of civil war mm -hmm. uh, over religion. So, but when it comes to the actual tech, which is what your question was about, the problem with muskets was that it took an experienced soldier to be able to load them about three times a minute. Yes. Generally, their range, if someone said that if you hit, was hit by a musket shot in over 300 yards, you then that was a fluke in the first place. And secondly, it wouldn't get past your shirt because their actual power wasn't that great. At close range, they were devastating. They were shock weapons. He'd fire them once, realize that the enemy was running towards them, and then spin them round, and they'd use them as clubs. Mm -hmm. um, and you've also got the pikemen that were sort of like placey, and these are the set battles, but in a lot of the game, there isn't set battles. So the best weapon to have would be the pit horse pistols, these... these I think they were about just under a foot long, these uh, flintlock pistols, or there were matchlock pistols as well. Mm -hmm. But I've tried to keep them as accurate to how they actually worked as possible. And uh, to be honest, of course they're an advantage, cause, but partly because they're a status symbol, and if you wave a pistol at somebody, they're going to back down. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you've got a bow and arrow, they're going to sort of, they're not going to react in the same way. Um but it's very unusual for anybody to be able to be able to use a bow and arrow in that age. The last official bows and arrows were about 1630-odd. They were still using them, but only on the fringe territories. So the, the most likely thing, they'd have good use of daggers and what the short swords, which were called hanger swords, and then the commanders would have the longer swords, which later on became called mortuary swords because they had the head of Oliver Cromwell on the pommel. Mm -hmm. but, if, but at the time, they were just commander swords were much longer. So it's very Dungeons and Dragons. And as far as the, 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 the firearms is concerned, it's pot luck whether you're going to get a good one, really. And... Um, I'm guessing. I'm guessing that with the with the way you have firearms, there's still a chance of um, misfiring. Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest problems they had, certainly, because the, the the only viable weapon match uh, weapons they had were the matchlocks because they were cheap to make. Flintlocks and wheel locks were far more expensive and very hard to repair in the field. Mm -hmm. The problem with matchlocks is certainly at night. If it was raining, you couldn't use them because they the the match itself, which is a bit of cord, would go out. If it wasn't raining, then the enemy can see you from quite a distance because you've got these glowy lights, <laughs> which are the actual matches waiting. To, so you wouldn't be able to creep up on anybody. Mm -hmm. um, generally, if you had a group of 10 soldiers and for any period, you'd have one or two of them with a lit match. And the rest of them would basically spend a round lighting their matches off them before they went into combat. Um, but they were clumsy and they were heavy. If you've ever picked up one of these matchlocks, very, very heavy weapons. Mm -hmm. um, far more elegant to just have a sword, to be honest. Yeah. And with that, now with that in with that in mind, something that something that I will I will. Admit that I find I find kind of interesting that it, that it's at its presence is the concept of of both of um, reaction speed as well as um, spell casting speed. Yes, 
spell casting, if you think spell casting is all in the mind, it's basically how fast can you think to deliver. So that's based on intelligence, whereas reaction speed is based on dexterity. So they're two different things. So um, when you start off in a round of combat, it, the, it, the easiest thing to do for a game master is to have the sheet, have the enemy, and have all the players and then just roll and then just put down what their base reaction speed is and if their spell cast is their base um, spell casting speed and literally from top to bottom in terms of height they go first so the bigger number goes first and it's the same every round that they're doing the same action so it's a very simple process and in some of in some of the adventure books that i've written i've put a page at the dm's page a game master's page at the back which has already pre-written mm -hmm. all the enemies reaction speeds so it makes it a really simple process of running a combat you don't have to keep checking you know the 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 modifiers having a chat with people that actually use weapons a long sword is going to get to you quicker than a dagger because it's longer, <laughs> yes. So, so unlike in Dungeons and Dragons, where they sort of have it the other way around, the longer the weapon, the higher the modifier. So, something like a two-handed sword, or um, let's shall we say a spear, will have a plus twenty percent on the reaction speed, whereas something like a dagger doesn't have any modifier. So, because it's actually slower. Once you've got past that pole arm with your dagger, then you've got an advantage. But then that's up to the game master to role play that out, um, mm -hmm. because you can't exactly use a pole on or something that's right up close to you. Not now, you know. Um, so spell casting is a similar. You have different spells, and they have different modifiers in terms of their reaction based on how complicated the spell is. Yeah, and I've seen I've seen a fair amount of. Um... Of, histor of historical games, whenever they use a magic system, they really double down on on, tr on treating every magic as every spell as a ritual unto itself. Um, when it comes when it comes yeah. to the type of items required, yeah. and the and sometimes the timing, um, and that can that can all be well and good, but that's a pendulum that can swing both ways because <laughs> and you then. When you have to have that level of specificity, it can it can sometimes be a turnoff. It's a nightmare. It will be a nightmare as every time you get in an action scene. The whole point of any role playing game is it's a filmic, interactive experience where mm. everybody gets to become part of the narrative. And if you've got this magic user in the background saying, "Hold on a moment, I've got to get this four leaf clover," and I've got to, and and so I cut that system out. I mean, if if the players themselves wants to pre-plan all that that's fine but once it gets I, i've divided my spells into two types one is an incantation and the other one is a ritual a ritual you do in in a magic circle or at stonehenge or in your specially prepared hearth if you're cunning folk mm -hmm. um and that's something that could take two to three hours to cast and that's and they're powerful spells very yeah. powerful spells incantations are very similar to the dnd stuff so i'm going to do a detect magic you've done a detect magic i'm not going to go into any so that when we get into the live action stuff you can go i'm going to cast that okay you cast a prayer you're going to be sitting in the back of the field casting your prayer and all, all your allies have now got a plus 10 percent on their attack rolls mm-hmm so that's as far as it goes. I, uh, I've, I've filled the book with stuff which you don't really need to role play it out unless the player wants to. I've got whole tables on the different magic circles, including the salt magic circles, which are used in the tele program Supernatural. I've put that in. There's fire rings, there's battle circles, there's turf circles, there's Stonehenge, there's tree circles. I've got loads of them. Uh, I've got how to make potions with the idea that you can just sort of pick up stuff as you go and then try and make your own potion right from the start if you're a cunning folk. You know, you can you can get to the campfire in the evening. You've picked up all these strange ingredients. You've got a vague idea of what you want to do, and you just throw them all in, put them in the pot, 
and see if there's a potion coming out of it. And I want players to actually have that amount of fun with their characters so so that it's you know, they're not keep on looking over their shoulder for the rule book in that sense i've got massive lists of all the different herbs plants trees animals supernatural beings and what the qualities of the most materials do so you can actually get a piece of unicorn horn and mix it with a four-leaf clover and if you want to do that if you don't it doesn't matter it won't change the game mm -hmm. So, with that with that in mind, I know I know you've um, I know you've done I know you've done a a fair, a fair few play tests with it with the game. Yeah. Um, what would you say were some of the some of the big takeaways and some of the big lessons you ended up learning through those play tests? The big takeaways initially are that this sounds really this sounds wrong. It's a better game than I thought it was. <laughs> um, I, I've recently played at a convention in Sheffield in uh, South Yorkshire, and they said, this is better than all the, the games that we've played so far. Everybody got to have a go. Everybody contributed. Everybody was doing something at all times. You didn't have this horrible situation where people were waiting 10 minutes for the other players to have their go. It was a sort of, a, it, it felt like everybody had a skill set that contributed to the whole at the whole time. Mm -hmm. that the actual percentage the actual dice rolling part of it was fun because it was loads of dice rolls you know and, and they were fun and someone said oh i'm going to try it like that do i get any modifiers yeah yeah have a go yeah oh i've got it that's great and and little things like that and they were just constantly feeling as if they could not just affect the narrative but in a way affect the system itself while they were playing mm -hmm. so it almost felt like a fate system it almost had that quality to it. It was a sort of, uh, and they said, no, this was just so much fun because we really felt as if we could um, interact with stuff and make a difference. Um, as far as taking away negative, I've, it's more to do with, if I was to criticize my own book, I could strip it down and get rid of all the historical stuff, all the miscel miscellaneous stuff, all the stuff that I loved looking through to get to the rules. And I could actually maybe make it into an 80-page book with just rules in it. But I don't think it's about that. When I set out to write the book itself, I started off with two things. My favourite role-playing game book on the planet is the first edition DM's Guide. And the reason is, is because I can randomly open any page and go, oh, that's interesting. I'll never use it, but I love this. And then I got the early version of the Call of Cthulhu books and it had the same effect. It felt like you had a list of automobiles, next page, monsters in Cthulhu, next page, sacred books, next. And it was seemed to have no no logical <laughs> assemblage whatsoever as a book and i really liked it so what i've what i have done is the end of king's book it's very clearly labeled out the chapters make total sense i haven't started it with a great big long story which for me is a killer in any role-playing book if <laughs> if you want to write read a story about the 17th century go somewhere else you know um I wanted it to start off right from the beginning with how to create a character, how to have the characters react with other things, how to fight, how much do things cost, what are the skills, what are the spells, where are the monsters, and here's a game to play. And that's what I've done in the book. I've tried to keep that real, you know, and then add all the other stuff which is perhaps useless and interesting like thieves cant of the period mm -hmm. and i found a list there was a, a sheriff of lancashire was a guy called william farrington and he wrote down a complete inventory of everything that was in his house and we're talking about a manor house so i've actually transcribed the whole thing into the book 
because it gives you an indicator of what nobility were like. I've also found people that have recorded what would be in a peasant's house and what would be in a yeoman's house. A yeoman is a freeman. They're somebody that owns their own property rather than just being living in someone else's house, yeah. And so I've put loads of stuff like that in. Um, loads of quotes from the time, loads of descriptions of what villages and towns were like. I've put um, all the vehicles from ships, wagons, horses. I've done all that stuff, and it's all in there. It's a, just a big miscellany of information. Um, and maybe there's too much of it, but I wouldn't change a thing, you know? Uh, although although it's, fun, it's funny you mentioned fate, because I was going to say it's... It would be like fate without the one thing that annoys me about fate. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what? <laughs> uh, I've talked. I've talked about this in the past, and I've made. I've made it clear that this is the. It's the reason why I have not reviewed any. Reviewed any other um, fate games because I feel like I'd be repeating myself. Mm. Um, it has. It has to do with one of the. With one of its big pillars, the aspect system. Yes. More sp now, the aspect system on its own isn't necessarily the problem that I have. The mm. problem is a lack of guidance. Yes. There isn't. There isn't really. I'm not. Ex I'm not expecting a whole list of this is a good. This is. These are the aspects you should be using or anything like that. Mm. But more the fact that it does not. It does not give pro proper guidance as to. What makes a good or a bad use of, say, high concept or trouble, mm. or e even just a general aspect that that would be yeah. um, invoked that would be invoked mm. in regular play? Yes. And I know some people would would say, "Well, it's a narrative game. You supposed you shouldn't need you shouldn't need that." When you're use when you have a mechanic that is based on tags, you are effectively handing the table a blank check. Yes. And yes. As far as far as the idea that you don't that you don't need that you don't need to put in those examples because narrative mm. bollocks. Pure unref pure <laughs> unrepentant bollocks because I have seen it I have seen it done in a, I've seen it done in similar narrativist games. Yes. Um the one of the big examples I bring up to people is not the end. Which is a which is a fantastic a fantastic narrativist game. Uh, yeah. And the, an, but the other example I bring up is that in Thirteenth Age, which is a in, which is a interesting take on D twenty. Yeah. Um, there is a there's a two page spread where they go into detail on a, on a similar blank check de design idea that that the game has called one unique thing. Right. And they go into these. Might, these would be good ideas. These are a bit questionable. Talk with your GM. And this is a absolutely not. And yeah. they do. They go into a paragraph or two about why for each of those examples. So you have yeah. a you have a um, benchmark to work to work around with the one unique thing. Mm. Mm. And there isn't really that in fate. No. And that the sole reason I did the sole reason I haven't done any reviews of Fate since is because I'd end up every time I would end up bringing that up and I'd just be repeating myself. Yes, yes, I've I've got I've got mechanics wherever I can. Mm -hmm. So because some and it's all down to the flavor that the players want. So I've yeah. sort of given it to. I haven't tried to be all things to all people. I mean that's silly. But what I have done is I've provided the mechanics. But there's two or three times actually in the core rule book where I've said this could also be resolved with uh, uh, narrative play. Because mm -hmm. I mean what 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 I've got what I've done to to make it simple right at the beginning that the, the play is sort of divided into 
narrative encounters and mm -hmm. combat encounters. Narrative encounters can be flexi time. Uh, you know, the players can say, okay, my character's spending two months off. He's going to visit his aunt Liz in Chiswick and uh, he comes back after a refreshing break. Mm -hmm. And I can say, okay, two months later. So that's sort of, that's an extreme form. If you're going to visit the local town lord, because you're, you're aware that one of the local members of the nobility um, is trying to raise an army by themselves, then that would be a narrative encounter. You sort mm -hmm. of like have to get past the the groom of the house, go you know, and get to the court itself, and then persuade. Now there are dice rolls. There's there's one of the features is called an influence check. Mm -hmm. So if before going in, uh, the priest has cast something like aid, which has improved your skill chances, uh, and if some uh, and if the cunning folk has cast something which actually makes you called hex. Hex, one of the skills of the spell hex, mm. is to actually make people appear to be far more gorgeous than they are. So if that's all been cast on them, and you've got past the courtyard's wards that prevent against magic, go up to the... And it's all narrative, even mm. though spells have been cast and dice have been rolled. And then you get into the combat system, which is moment by moment, where it's all but there's quite a lot of times where I've actually said, you could roll the dice, or you don't need to. You can just role play it. Mm -hmm. And and I and and I think it's up to the the game master because I mean, if you go all the way back to the very early Dungeons and Dragons stuff, I mean, that was the secret of Gary Gygax. He sort of pretty much said, you know, dice rolls are sort of optional here, folks. Um, mm -hmm. If you've got something you want to swing from a chandelier, run onto the dining room table uh, uh, before diving onto the enemy from behind, blah, 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 then don't have them make a dexterity check and then fall off the chandelier. They've decided to do a heroic Errol Flynn-type move. Allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. So this is where, even in Dungeons & Dragons, that would work. I mean, that's what I'd go for. I want to maximise the players' imaginations. Yeah. I want them to have the chance, within the logic of the game, and knowing that there are boundaries, to say, I'm going to try this crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, Um but you have to have you have to have parameters to it. Yeah, and I do th I do think that a lot I do think that a few a few folks who ke who keep screaming story at me ev every mm. every time I bring the stuff up with say fate um, tend to f tend to forget tend to forget in my opinion that th that this is that RPG stands for role playing game. Game yes. being the operative yes. word here. Yes, yes. Um, yes, absolutely. My men my mentor would always would always say that a in this in the same vein that a novelist is shorthand for a shit DM. No disrespect <laughs> to any, no disrespect to any no, no disrespect to any novelists, but it is what it is. <laughs> it's a very strange thing I find myself doing because I'm writing whereas a novelist writes things to a usually they write things towards a resolution mm -hmm. and then they give the reader the resolution they give them the 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 hooks the confusions the red herrings all that stuff mm -hmm. uh, the tensions the climaxes and anticlimaxes all that stuff and then it all draws towards some form of resolution even if it says okay there's going to be a sequel you know that sort of stuff mm -hmm. in a, in adventure writing you're setting everything up to the present tense and then saying this is these are the branches of the future that you need to that you might explore mm -hmm. and it's a very strange alternative form of story writing where you're 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 leaving threads of story for the players to pick up and run with and it's what's difficult in that is knowing what to write and what to leave out completely because mm -hmm. if you're not careful, you're going to write so many different bloody threads heading forwards that it becomes impossible to look at as a book. So uh, and so you've got to balance railroading them with giving them likely options, uh, but giving something for the game master to think to, to, to resolve as well. Because inevitably players are going to go for that X thing that hasn't been put in the book. And for goodness sake, allow them to do it. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Yeah. And I always I always I always bring up um rule 0 to people. If you which is basic is basically if the there's there's multiple ways that it's that it's written, but the best way that I can summarize it is if the rules are getting in the in the way of in the way of a of a of a story, story wins up uh, the story that the play, that the table wants to tell, the table wins mm. out. Definitely, definitely. Oh. Yeah. Now there's usually a, I usually add a corollary to rule zero that is don't be a dick, but. <laughs> Unless you're the unless you're the GM, then being a di then being a dick is kind of a requirement to a point. I, I'm I'm pretty brutal. Um, <laughs> uh, quite a few times, what I've written is what's written. Sometimes I've got certain players that keep hypothesizing about what be, might be happening next, which immediately goes, "Hey, that's even better of an idea than mine." Um, I wonder if I should uh, no, and I, and, I, and sometimes I go with it because the smile on their faces when they think they predicted what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in fact I just changed everything in my head. You know, this is this um, is where this is where <laughs> me having my reputation kind kind of bites me because even if I t even if I tell the players that there that there's no that the door isn't trapped, they're still going to check mm. for traps anyways because they don't because they don't trust my word on that. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and that that comes that's one of those tricks as the game master really is that. Uh, Certainly, if you've got someone like a thief who's checking for traps, you do the dice roll. They don't, oh. and you say, and, and always, and you say you don't see any traps, and that makes well, them feel even worse. My <laughs> the solution that the solution that I that I have had is um is what I call fake traps. Mm. They are they ha they have the mechanism of traps. They have the setup of traps. They have the activation of traps. But once yep. they're activated, they don't do anything. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yes. It, it, um, I put, I put, I put them in a few dungeons that, as to, as to say, not every, not every trap is going to, is going to explode. You fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> as it, in the, in this particular case, they were the th the th It was a group of thieves who were hired by somebody. To make to make sure that their that their vault was properly secured, i.e., yeah. i.e., um, if you if you can if you can break if you can break into my vault, um, half of what's mm. in there is yours. Yes, yes. The key word here is if, <laughs> <laughs> and all of them having to sign sign a release saying. With saying that, saying that um, the owner is the owner is not responsible for any um, any maiming, burning, mm. acid, acidic damage, freezing, I love it. electrocution, <laughs> decapitation. <laughs> ah, and I love it. Also, de also death, and also death is a registered trademark, so no impugning, mm. no impugning on that when saying we're all going to die. Um, yeah. It, have I have I not made it clear that I t that, I t that I took way too much inspiration from both um, Terry Pratchett and Monty Python, <laughs> especially oh, Terry God, Pratchett? One of, the, one of the Monty Python ones where you've got this uh, guy that's designed a building, hmm. and he says, and they go through the front entrance through the past the rotating knives, and it, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Oh, oh dear, I haven't yet uh, put the rabbit in there. Into one of the games. I I have I have not done I have not done that. I have I have utilized the whole I have utilized the holy hand grenade. Oh, um, lovely. lovely! I um I also I also utilized a a um a one off that was meant to be stealth training that was um was ver was taking a few nods from the from the bit how not to be seen. Yes. Uh and although um although I I I took more notes from the film version instead of the TV version because I'm not blowing up China. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, just as a side issue to that, uh, the first version of the kickstart I did for End of Kings in the text, mm -hmm. the the game sort of starts when Elizabeth Tudor dies in 1603. Okay. That's that's mm -hmm. when I've sort of set it from effectively, mm -hmm. and the Kickstarter 
uh, the, the first paragraph started is, the Queen is dead. <laughs> Elizabeth is no more. And I was just about to press the launch button, and my wife realised that Queen Elizabeth II had just died. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and she said, you better change that. You better change yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh that, God. That is that is a case of that is a case of eleven of um yanking something out of the fire at the eleventh hour. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> well, um, you may not be a royalist, but that's a bit. <laughs> uh, oh God. Mm. I think the. You pro you probably could you probably could have snuck a reference in that s saying this saying we hadn't we had a we had a different entry but the person responsible for that entry has been sacked. Yes. <laughs> but, Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I will I will admit I I will admit when it comes I take I take I take certain notes from Monty Python when it comes to one, when it comes to doing more humorous one shots but I take an mm. equal amount of inspiration from Terry Pratchett's work. Good. Which I, he, I still maintain that he has my favorite interpretation of the Grim Reaper. Mort, <laughs> fantastic. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, I've, I've got. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of fairies that I did research on. One of them mm -hmm. is a church grim, mm -hmm. and a church grim, if, according to the fairy folk, of course, death isn't a thing at all because they just treat it as okay. Well, the soul's going from that place to the other. What's the issue? Mm -hmm. So a church grim will ring the bell when somebody's going to die in the village. Mm -hmm. So all the villagers think he's a harbinger of doom, that, oh, God, he's foretelling death, and may he be he's even causing it. Whereas, in fact, he's celebrating. Mm -hmm. He's going, you're about to be reborn into, into your next version, so I'm celebrating by ringing the bell. So you've got this stuff about death, which is quite interesting. And this is why I have problems in a lot of other and, and i've tr tried to do my best with this role-playing game with end of kings to try and redress the balance when it comes to what the dungeons and dragons people turned into the elves and the dwarves and the gnomes and stuff because they're not that i mean effectively and i love dungeons and dragons and i love the elves and all that in that mm -hmm. but basically they're pointy-eared humans yeah and but... dwarves are, dwarves are uh, a short stout scottish accented humans <laughs> we ha i have i have played in i have played into the into into the into that up uh, into that a bit with the with mm. a there's a rec when we when we cover when my co-host zan and i covered a interesting little game called heavens and heresies we ended up mm. creating a care because of how we read the druid we ended up creating mm. a dwarven druid named named angus who uh, who re who um the best way to describe him is the gag that I use with the, with the Lorax as it as in the Dr. Seuss character. Yes. I'm the Lorax. I speak for the trees and the trees say to fuck off. <laughs> he doesn't like people in his forest and he especially and well a, co a common question that's that's been asked over the years is why do dwarves always use axes when they live underground? And uh, Zan really? has the perfect answer. Elves live in trees. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You see, in End of Kings, they're, they're elemental beings. Mm -hmm. So so the dwarf is literally... I mean, I, I go with the old folklore that some of the standing stones that you see about you mm -hmm. were actually dwarves that mm -hmm. caught the first light of day and so became petrified. Mm -hmm. um, so, and... and it, the bigger versions of them, the ogre and the the uh, younger giant species, mm -hmm. they are literally hills. Mm -hmm. So that if you get the right spells together, you can wake up a hill, and it might have actually have a village on it. So we we're talking about almost like Japanese gargantua, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I, I I'm not ruling that out. But so so elves are the sylvan folk. So they've they've basically got this the sylvan folk are definitely they're more about plants trees and all that stuff mm -hmm. they have elements of earth in them the dwarves definite earth races obviously got the water spirits and the 
like the merfolk and stuff. Mm -hmm. Fire, fire is a temporary element. Under most circumstances, it can't exist by itself. It has to be caused by something, and it has to be maintained with something that isn't it. Mm -hmm. So I've actually, in my system, there's three three main elements, water, air, and earth. And then the fire is the rip in the veil itself. So a candle is a tear in the veil. And this is why fire and, and candlelight you know, included is used by spellcasters because it's literally opening up a valve for magical energies. So oh. that's so, so that's how I've treated it. There are a couple of creatures like the Drake, which is actually a small boy made of fire, mm -hmm. which uh, which is actually a fire-based element, but they're very, very rare because fire can't be maintained by itself. Volcanoes are pretty much a perpetual rift in the veil. So the amount of magical energy coming out of them is ridiculous. Yeah, but good good luck good luck finding an act good yeah. luck finding an act or an inactive volcano. <laughs> yeah, in but the the other the other thing I was going to say is that the big problem with historical games in general, and something that I just want to try and get away from a little bit, is the lack of sense of humor. That because it's all historical, everyone has to be all sort of yeah. <laughs> And, and when I start reading about what actually happened, they certainly weren't religious zealots. Most of the common folk couldn't be bothered to go to church and tended to use it as a marketplace. And there was quite a few times where they were told to keep their livestock out of church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So, so the reality of the situation, I, I, I'm, I'm desperate to try and lighten it all up so that it isn't, like your very first question, it isn't bogged down in historical detail as if his, like everybody suddenly went all serious and wear plain uniforms and sort of saying, ooh, that's blasphemy. It's, it, I want it to be more than that. I want, it, I want it to be guys down the pub. I want it to be the stuff that actually isn't written down in history, which is yeah. all the jokes and the humor and the folk stories and the stuff like that, you know. Most of the time that I've most of the time that I've run um, military leaning ca campaigns, whether it be mm. unfortunately Phoenix Command or even even something as dour as tw as Twilight Two Thousand, far mm. too much of it is based on the st based on the um, military stories, or at least inspired by these stories that people yeah. have told me who have. Who have served yeah. in in various uh, various armies, navies, and the like, and mm. a lot and a lot of that, a lot of that particular st that particular style of humor. Mm. Um, mm. In fact, I have a, I have a list of I have a list called the rules of combat that they don't teach you on my wall, which has th <laughs> which has things like five second grenade timers only last three seconds. Yes. If you can't remember, the claymore is pointed toward you. Um, no, in, no inspection ready unit has ever passed combat, and no combat ready unit has ever pa has ever passed inspection. <laughs> yes, yes. Trace, um, tracer rounds work both ways. Yes. The if you're short of if um, radials will fail as soon as you need fire support, <laughs> and never share a foxhole with anyone braver than you. I love that. I love that. And you see, I mean, yeah. There's, and the w one film that was a gut, one film that was a godsend for me when when it came out, just just to just to help illustrate the tone that I was that I wanted to go through with my players was mm. Inglorious Bastards. Yes, I haven't seen it. I want to. The other the other thing that that helped was um even though the the game it's. The game itself was a disappointment, but the initial pitch was something that I stuck to was a mm. project called Overstrike, which when it was released right. it would become Fuse and like I said it'd be a disappointment. And mm. also a lesson in why you shouldn't rely too much on um, focus groups. Mm. But mm. the idea the idea with Overstrike is it's th it's this it's this elite covert o um covert operations organization. Your your MI sixes, your C, your CIA's, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, all the all the usual hallmarks that you see with a spy fiction. Yeah. But the mem but the but the cast that was supposed to be the focus. They they are the misfits. They're good at their job. Mm -hmm. They just have problems. 
A little bit, yes. a little bit of zealot, a little bit of zealotry, a little bit of weirdness. Mm. They're they're the people who tend who everybody else in the agency tends to look at sideways because when they get involved, things tend to get blown up, Love intentionally it. or otherwise. Yes, yes. Oh, just to just to add that bit of levity, because you are right. A lot of I I think a, I think a lot of people when it comes to just historical discussion. Um, take the take themselves seriously to a point where they where they miss the forest for the trees. Yeah. Oh, I've the I've I've seen plenty I've seen plenty of stories about about people about um designers who thought they were making the perfect the perfect um vehicle for military, and then they then they put the thing out in testing and it completely sucks. <laughs> They've overthought it. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and to me, that kind of that kind of thing is funny. <clears throat> <laughs> like, I've even even in, even in fantasy campaigns, and st even when I'm supposed to be taking things seriously, I will give my players what I'll give my players weaponry that is powerful, but is ex but is not safe. Um, yes, I yes. I devised a sonic crossbow at one point that was. A blatant ripoff of the noisy cricket from Men in Black. Yes. So, does it do a lot of damage? <laughs> yes. You're gonna get knocked on your. You're gonna get knocked on your ass and sent flying twenty feet when you fire the thing, though. Because, mm. uh, because recoil it. works both ways. Yes. Yes. Oh. Uh, mm. When I think there was one, there was one, I think there was one instance where some where somebody he could. He he was able to do produce flame, but he could only he could only produce it in small amounts. And yeah. when somebody was was about to fire a um, bo a bow at him, as they have the bo as they have the bow um, drawn, he uses he said, "Can I can I bur can I um can I bur can I burn the ro can I burn the rope on his bow?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah go ahead." So he he did that. The bow s snapped and hit the guy, and the cord <laughs> hits the guy in the face. I love it. <laughs> like just those, just those, li just those little things. Because you've got um, to, you've got um, to. Mel Brooks but, but... at one point said, "Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die." <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. But yeah, I mean, I, th I mean, your description of the sort of like the rebellion. I mean, in, in the skirmish system, which I'm developing at the moment, friend of kings, I, I couldn't exactly have a a game that's focused around the English Civil War and not have a battle from the English Civil War involved. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I didn't want to turn it into one of these diorama things mm -hmm. where you've got rulers out and all that stuff. So I've, I've tried to um, do my best creating what I hope is quite a simple system. Um, but, yeah... I'm trying to remember what I was going to say now. Um, look, that's what happens when you're on these live shows. Um, <laughs> well, this, um, this is no, the reason oh. why I never, I never claimed that my show is <laughs> pro is professional or or anything like that. No, I'm just, I'm just an it's asshole perfect. in the middle of nowhere who likes games and drinking. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> but with that in mind, what what are you shooting for as far as a page count for um, End of Kings? End of Kings is 330 pages, mm -hmm. just around 330 pages. Mm -hmm. um, um, I've got, and that's pretty much written. Mm -hmm. um, I might add two or three more pages, but I've been basically fine-tuning it over the last three or four years. As mm -hmm. a, as a, and I keep finding one more thing, and my wife's saying, look, it's done now. says, no, it isn't. There's that. <laughs> I recently I recently I realized that I hadn't I'd done an awful lot about divination mm -hmm. within the spell casting element and I've given it a separate skill check uh on purpose and I suddenly realized that I hadn't gone into the methods of divination in terms of the actual objects like mm -hmm. crystal balls and so I suddenly had to shoehorn that in, sort of different types of crystal balls and witches' balls and all this sort of stuff. And they're all made in different ways. And also there's the smoking mirrors, the one that uh, Dr. John D had, which is made out of, what's that black stone? Can't remember. Obsidian? 
that's the baby. And uh, so they've all sl got slightly different things. And some of them might house demons within as well, which will distort the vision and all this. So I've suddenly had to uh, shoehorn that in. And um, people are saying, look, you've got enough for a supplement now. Could you just stop? And I go, well, but, but. So I, I've, I've done that. I've got uh, a quick start version. Which is literally, it's got, and, they've, and the main core rule book's got its own adventure in it uh, called Five Lords Are Leaping, mm -hmm. which is about, which is, I think it's a fun storyline. I'm not going to go into details. Yeah. And then in the quick start, I've got a different short, short uh, opener called Galtrot, which is where there's a pagan um, spirit. I mean, most Christian church in, in, on the, in the United Kingdom have been built on what had been pagan sites. And it was a sort of a Roman thing to take over that site and make it, you know. So it's, if one of those pagan things gets woken up, then what's gonna happen? So that's what that one's about. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I can't remember how many pages that is. And then I've got two more adventures that are pretty much finished. One of them's called uh, A Plague on Their Houses. And that's based on the Magnificent Seven, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, I won't go into details, but it's based on the Magnificent Seven, and, and both uh, I, we love both versions of the film. Yeah. Um, my daughter especially loves the second one, mm -hmm. um, and the also Nature of the Beast, which is if a sort of a hammer horror werewolfy thing. Yep. But all of them, if you want to, they nod towards actual historical stuff, like Nature of the Beast looks into what had happened about 10, 20 years before in history, which was called the Plantation of Ulster, where James I decided he was going to take over Ireland by force. Mm -hmm. And and so that's got that it referenced into it. Um, the next one is... I suddenly realized I was missing out the more mundane stuff and I wanted to do something that was city based. So I've written one called the Spanish coin and it starts off with a young where uh, the son of a warehouse owner that tries to pay for his beer. And he doesn't realize that the silver coin that he's got is actually from Spain, mm -hmm. which, which implies that his dad's dealing with Spanish goods, which is pretty against the law at the time because the Spanish were sort of the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, and that leads, it's sort of that single coin leads to a massive adventure to do with gun running and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the latest one I'm in the middle of writing is called Wreck, and that's based on a real event of a Spanish galleon that grounded on the northwest coast of the country in 1643. But I'm throwing into that what happens when the Demeter lands at Whitby in the Dracula story mm -hmm. and the fact that everybody on board is dead, which means that something killed them and is now in the countryside. So I've, so I'm sort of, so uh, it accidentally, a lot of them have got demons in, a lot of them have got pagan spirits. A lot mm -hmm. of them have got that almost a sub Cthulhu nature to them. And I didn't intend it, but it's there, you know, uh, that sense that just beyond the borders, there's untapped energy, which is so powerful that it could change the future of the planet. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, so I'm just playing with that in all of them. So the hardback core rule book, um, is pretty much done and dusted. It's 330 pages, um, filled with everything. I think I've already been through it all. Mm -hmm. And I, I will look forward to seeing how it de how it develops with time and what cool. sort what sort of shenanigans um, occur as occur as a result. Oh. We've got yeah, we've got future ones. I'm I'm uh, onto the breach is going to be the skirmish system. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also got a miscellaneous one. It's sorry, uh, alarms excursions is, is going to be a book on short encounters. So that but it's it's the classic thing. You've got people between one location and another. Oh come on, let's throw them throw something at them. Mm -hmm. So it's that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, I've hesitated over writing a book about village life and stuff because i think I, that i don't think that would be very exciting mm -hmm. but there <laughs> so but with that with that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here <laughs> I've, been, I've loved it 
And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Ah. Oh. I've just had some uh, some rum mm -hmm. while we were talking, so there you go, I did. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>